They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. And welcome to another edition of the TDN Writers Room. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Returning this November, Keeneland will offer a single session dedicated to racehorses on the final day of the November sale, which is November 17th. And I'm Bill Finley, the host today of the TDN Writers Room. I'm Randy Moss of NBC Sports and the Buyer Speed Figures, shifting now into full-scale Breeders' Cup prep mode, as I'm sure you guys are as well. I'm Zoe Cadman. I work for XB TV and Santa Anita, and really, really looking forward to working with you guys today. We've got a lot of good stuff coming up. Yeah, it should be a fun show. What we're going to dive right into mainly is the preps from last weekend with so much big action. And uh, we're going to go kind of race by race. And before I want to get into that, special shout out and congratulations to our man, John Green from DJ Stable. John and Len Green and the DJ Stable family won the Alcibiades with Wonder Wheel Friday at Keeneland. She's going now, of course, in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Philly. So try, trying to win the race for the second time since 2018 when they won with Jay Walk. So well done, John Green. We miss you on the show, but congratulations on a big win at Keeneland. Okay, so let's move on now. We just talked briefly, ever so briefly, about the juvenile Phillies. Uh, so many different divisions to go over, Randy. And let's start with the juvenile because I thought that was one of the biggest stories of the weekend. And you had two major races, the American Pharaoh won by Cave Rock and, of course, the Breeders' Futurity at Keeneland won by Forte. I want to start with the American Pharaoh. A couple observations. Obviously, Cave Rock was was just dynamite in that race. He'll be the favorite in the Breeders' Cup uh, Juvenile. I think one thing, though, that's been a little bit overshadowed, why are we showing more love to Bob Baffert for finishing one, two, three, four in that race? A Bob Baffert cold superfecta of the four entrants he had in there. And this is something that's bugged me about racing for some time. Was it the only time in racing history that somebody finished one, two, three, four in a grade one? We have no idea. Uh, in every other sport, we can tell you who was the leading left-handed pinch hitter in 1907 in, in baseball. And yet horse racing doesn't have anything close to that for historical significance. So that's just my little pet peeve of the week. But I don't want to start negative because Cave Rock was fantastic. Bob Baffert was fantastic. I was a little disappointed in his Jazzy. He ran well to be second, but I thought perhaps he could beat Cave Rock. I still see that $3.55 million price tag and think this guy's got to be a monster. But but Randy, certainly Cave Rock's the one to beat in a couple weeks now at Keeneland in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Yeah, he'll almost certainly be a pretty solid favorite. You know, undefeated. He's got the pedigree. He's obviously got the, got the coach with Bob Baffert. And in talking to Bob before that race in uh, sort of in preparation for what we were doing with NBC, since he had a, since he had a couple of horses in the Breeders' Futurity at Keeneland, uh, he pointed out that his, his only real concern about Cave Rock was what he called the, uh, the imaginary, he called the invisible wall that some horses run into when they try to go a mile in a 16th and stretch out around two turns for the very first time. Uh, he mentioned to me that when he ran American Pharaoh uh, for the very first time around two turns, uh, he was just as concerned that he didn't really know when they turned for home. He thought, OK, now this is when we're really going to find out if this horse wants to go around two turns. Uh, so he felt the same way going into that race about the uh, imaginary wall with K Rock. And obviously that was not to be. I mean, the horse did control the pace, but he he gives you the impression, in my opinion, at least, that he's not a runoff, that if, if some other horse were to jump out and uh, and go really quick and set the pace in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, that he'd be just fine sitting second or maybe even third. From a speed figure perspective, it was a, another heck of a race for Cave Rock. And right now it looks like all systems go. The runner-up is interesting to me as well, National Treasure, because in talking to Bob, I mean, he was very high on National Treasure going into that race. he It seemed to me that he was even higher on National Treasure than he was on Hijazi, although he didn't just come out and say that to me, two different owners, um, I believe. But uh, he pointed out that his goal, what, what he wanted to do was send National Treasure to Keeneland. And he thought National Treasure would have won the Breeders' Futurity had he been able to send him out there. But he was told and I think we touched on this last week as well. He was told by the Keeneland Racing Office that National Treasure wouldn't be able to draw into an overprescribed race uh, due to a lack of overall earnings. Uh, but, you, you know, I, I thought it was just a sensational performance. 
from both horses. And one more note uh, to your point about the lack of, uh, you know, of information that we get, uh, media information about, for example, one, two, three, four finishers. I tried to look some stuff up this morning uh, <laughs> to no avail. And finally, had to send a text message to our buddy Dave Grenig of DRF because I knew if anyone had run one, two, three, four in a Chad great morning stakes before, it would be Chad Brown. And Dave Grenig would obviously know about it. And he texted me back and he said, this year's Diana. And I looked it up and indeed it was in Italian technical analysis, Bleecker Street and Rougier who finished one, go. two, three, four in the grade one Diana. So at least we know that, Bill, after uh, <laughs> after this weekend. <laughs> okay. Thanks for yeah, clearing that up, Randy. Yeah. And I'm in agreement. Cave Rock, I was there. He was fantastic. Now, a lot of people said, oh, he looks just like Arrogate. He's really a, a much more compact son of Arrogate than we've seen. He's not quite as stretchy. He's out of a Bellamy Road mare. So he's a little bit thicker, but boy, oh boy, can he move over the ground. He seems to have it all. He can be close. He can sit off of horses. He's very relaxed in the morning. He was relaxed in the afternoon. And I actually spoke to Bob on Sunday morning and I'm like, hey, yeah, uh, that has a big horse. And he was like, oh, I, I got into the barn this morning and I was like, Jimmy, is everything OK? Are we all standing on all fours. Is everything all right? And he was relieved that he was. And I said, what about the runner up? Because, Randy, you, you basically gave me the exacta and National Treasure went off at nine to one. And yeah, he was nine to one and ran up and he. And Bob went into it and said, I really wanted to run him at Keeneland, but I didn't have enough earnings. So he's still very high on National Treasure as well. No one's touching Cave Rock, but he does have backup with National Treasure. So let's go to the Breeders' Futurity now at Keeneland and Forte, the Todd Pletcher Show. We're going to talk to Todd a little bit later on in today's uh, TDN Writers Room uh, podcast. It was the Todd Pletcher Show over the weekend. Obviously, Forte is going to be, I would assume, the second choice in the juvenile uh, coming off a, a very strong win, two time grade one winner, hopeful now, and the Breeders Futurity. But uh, I was really impressed as well with the runner up Loggins. I mean, this horse had nothing go his own way. He had to duel on the lead, a very strong pace. And then it looked like Forte was going to run away and hide from him in the stretch. And he fought back very valiantly to only lose by a neck. Um, two very good horses, a good horse race. Uh, who's going to be the better of the two down the road? I'm not sure it's not Loggins, but I don't want to take anything away from Forte either, Randy. Yeah, I mean, Forte basically got a, a very nice setup. I wasn't all that high on him going off of that sloppy track effort in the hopeful. I thought maybe he was helped in that race by a very, very sloppy track. But boy, did he did he justify that status? I thought it was a terrific race by Forte, but, Forte, but Loggins... Just in his first lifetime start, and he got squeezed on the rail. He showed some moxie because if you watch the head on, I read Ortiz whips, got awful close to that horse's head, shoulder, you name it. It was a look at Randy. <laughs> a little Sonny Leon action there, maybe. That was some race riding right there. And, you know, if you really zoomed into it, it was perhaps a little closer than a lot of people have thought. That was some serious race riding that we've seen time and time again from Irad Ortiz. <laughs> but uh, I thought Loggins was very, very game in defeat. I just hope that wasn't too much of a big race before the bigger dance for Breeders' Cup. What do you think, Randy? That's a that's a that's a great point. Uh, regarding the uh, the stretch run, right? With Florent Giroux obviously claims foul aboard Loggins. For those who didn't get a chance to watch the race live, it was disallowed. Uh, we were showing it on NBC, and you know they put up the head on replay uh, for us to look at on NBC. The monitor is pretty far away, so we can't really get right up close to it and see. And it it certainly looked as if, in my opinion at least, uh, from a positional standpoint. When Forte shifted in a little bit to crowd Loggins, it didn't really get to the point where I believe a disqualification was warranted. Now, this morning, I got a monitor right here, close up, and I go back to that race and I look at the head-on replay. And Zoe, I'll be damned if I'm not convinced that Irad Ortiz didn't hit Loggins in the chest with a whip at least twice and maybe three times. Now you can't you can't really I don't think you can disqualify because it it, it 
the depth perception on the head-on replay makes it impossible to say for sure that he hit the horse in the chest. But, I mean, we all know, we see jockeys that, that flag horses with the whip next to their eyes to try to get their attention. He had the whip in his left hand. But instead of doing this, obviously, next to uh, Forte's eyes to keep his attention, he's doing this crossways. And it certainly looked like he hit Loggins in the chest with a whip. And it happens when you're in close contact. Like I've I've been a rider and I've been hitting left-handed and I've actually hit a, a jockey before and came back and he's like, Zoe, look at my arm. I've got welts all over my arm. I'm like, I'm sorry. But it, it does happen when you're riding in close quarters. But that, that was pretty Pretty close. This looked intentional was, because it was yeah. a, it was definitely at an angle and it was not your normal up and down stroke with the whip. Uh, so there's that. And I, to me, that just adds to what Bill was saying about the kind of race, the kind of gritty race that Loggins ran. Second lifetime start, um, coming back on only three weeks rest, which for, I mean, you know, we talk about that a lot as being overrated and it may be. But Brad Cox typically likes to give his horses more time in between races. Uh, the pace was exceptionally fast by Keeneland standards. You very seldom see races, especially for two-year-olds, at a mile and a 16th go 22 and change, 46 and change, uh, and the horses keep running. The horses that were within a couple of lengths of Loggins early in the race, Newgate finished seven lengths back. The others finished anywhere from 20 to 30 lengths back. They totally caved in after that kind of pace, and yet Loggins was still on the inside fighting, fighting, fighting all the way to the wire. I agree that right now, I think you would say that Loggins ran the most impressive race of the two, given everything. Although uh, you certainly can't take anything away, as you pointed out from Forte in victory, because he ran, a, he ran an excellent race himself. Really entertaining race to watch. Rad Ortiz taking an edge, pushing the envelope, saying it ain't so, guys. Come on. Where are you going with this? All right, let's move along now to the horses that are coming into next to the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Once again, as we talked about the Todd Pletcher show, Nest in the Bell Dame out at Aqueduct. Uh, and, you know, she, it was kind of reminds me of Life is Good in the Woodward. She's, you know, one to a thousand. She's running against overmatched horses. But what I liked about her race was what I didn't necessarily like about Life is Good's race in the Woodward, which was kind of workmanlike. This was anything but. She just, again, put on a show. Now, you know, how much do you put into that considering that that's exactly what she was supposed to do? She's supposed to beat those horses as easily as she did. But she's just terrific. I, I mean, she goes out every time and runs her race. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I hope they so much. I hope they try to run her against boys next year. So I think she's really worthy up, up to the task. So then we will see what happens when she meets her stable mate and others, Malathat, the winner of the spinster stakes uh, at Keeneland the following day. Todd Pletcher has the first and second favorites for the Breeders' Cup distaff. Boy, is he loaded. Well, let's, let's start with the Bell Dame. I, I think really the only thing, given circumstances, that we can take away from the Bell Dame is that Nest will continue in her good form going into the Breeders' Cup. It's three runaway wins in a row. Unfortunately, in this situation, this is probably the worst Bell Dame stakes in memory. It's got to be one of the worst Bell Dame stakes of all time. I mean, we're used to seeing, you know, these the, these outstanding, you know, Phillies deep fields going in the Bell Dame. This was nest at one to nine against Mains and Tails, basically. Not, you know, not to, you know, to uh, disparage the competition too severely, because I'd like to own any one of those other horses as well. But, you know, nest wins by nine and three quarters lengths, and which, as you pointed out, is what she was supposed to do. OK, uh, she was just basically doing everything on her own. Until, until they turned for home. And then she was steered out into the four and five path and given a couple of shakes of the rain and, and off she went. Running time is interesting. You can't put a lot into that either. A mile and an eighth and 152 and change for a couple of reasons. First of all, the track was slow at Aqueduct. We've seen many times that when the track is that slow at Aqueduct, the mile and an eighth races are even slower uh, and there was no competition. So there was no one to push nest coming through the lane. It, it made it for a tough speed figure race. Uh, if you just use the final time alone in buyer speed figures, you'd get something like an 87. And we know that Nest running, winning the Bell Dame by nine and three quarters deserves a bigger number than that. Uh, I think in the end, uh, the, the decision was made to give her a 101 figure. It's just really a, an educated guess. 
but definitely she's going into the Breeders' Cup now, clicking on all cylinders. And I think that's the most important takeaway. She was terrific. I mean, seven for 10 lifetime. She's she's done everything that's really ever been asked of her. It begs you to wonder the couple of times she's got beat right now, how that actually happened. But she's been terrific. And we'll we'll hear from Todd Pletcher just a little bit later on, on how terrific she's been. And it'll be really interesting to put him on the spot and ask him about a matchup between her and Malifat. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to get him to pick which horse is better, at least publicly. No. That. Another thing about Malifat, she's the best horse that never looks that good winning. And she, you know, she has to be written hard ridden by John Velasquez. You know, it's not maybe not so much so in the Spencer and some of the races. She's under a drive at the three eights. And you think she's not going anywhere. And then in the uh, when she put away the horses in the spinster, I thought she loafed in the stretch. It looked like she was just sort of pulling herself up in there. Um, I didn't like the way she necessarily finished. But again, she does that every single time. And she always, not always wins, but always runs a big race. Um, the other observation from the uh, spinster is uh, it, it's kind of sad to see what's become of Latruska. Let's not forget what how great she was last year. I mean, we were talking about her being possibly horse of the year. She's simply not the same horse this year at all. She was fourth, beaten 16 and three quarter lengths. I called Fausto Gutierrez this morning. He says he's going to give her a battery of tests and see if they can go over with a fine tooth comb and find anything wrong with her. He did not rule out running her in the distaff, which I was surprised. I can't see going into the distaff off a race like that. So, um, Malith had any other observations from our crew on the space to race? Isn't is she five or six? She's six. five, isn't she? Or she's she's six. six. Yeah. yeah, so I think, you know, a lot of these mares, these older mares, when when they turn six, they they don't want to play anymore. Right. I mean, you know, I consider myself an older mare now, and sometimes I don't want to play on a Saturday night either. So I, <laughs> I think maybe her mind's not on running, and it she's not been the same this year, and she's always been a war horse. You know, I've kind of stood up and said maybe they went to the well one too many times, but she's she's a tough knocking old mare. And I think this year she's just like, I'm done. And that's that's what it looks like. Yeah, I, I thought it was the absolute perfect prep for Malathat. Uh, because Latruska, you know, was a step slowly away from the gate, which probably means that she's, you know, I don't want to say a little sour, but she's definitely, you know, not the same sharp Latruska that we're accustomed to seeing. The pace was slow and Malafat was able to really stay in contention just a couple of lengths while going very easily. And you pointed out that this wasn't one of those races where she had to be ridden really hard by John Velasquez, which is unusual for Malafat. But she was able just to cruise uh, up to those leaders, up to Latruska around the second turn, who had gone on away from played hard and it opened up a length and a half. But clearly it was not the same Latruska. And Malafat was just in cruise control down the lane. Velasquez pointed out to us that she does tend to idle. And I think Todd said the same thing whenever she makes the lead. So he was worried about getting to the lead too soon, but there was really no other alternative because Lutruska basically stopped in front of him. And there he is, you know, there he is on a two length lead at the three sixteenths pole. So her number, again, looking at numbers, I know a lot of people look at numbers to handicap is a 98 buyer speed figure, which is not really indicative, indicative of her best performances because of the way the race was run. She did idle, I think, coming down through the stretch. She didn't have anybody to really keep her focused. And I think she's capable of running faster than that. And I think she will uh, run faster than that when she uh, gets to the distaff. And that's one of the reasons Todd, Todd put the blinkers on her in the first place. She's a fantastic workhorse in the morning, but she idles in the afternoon. She got the perfect trip under Johnny V inside, swung her outside. And I'll tell you how much she had left in the tank, because when she hit the wire, she almost propped. She saw something on the outside and she gave a stutter step. She almost lost Johnny B right at the wire, right after the wire. If you watch ahead on, you'll see her jinx. And Johnny B about lost his balance. He said she almost dropped him. All right, gang, uh, you've got three and a half weeks to change your mind. Who's the filly to beat in the Breeders' Cup distaff? I'll say Nest. Malathat. I'll, I'll say Nest. Okay, so two two nests, one Malathat. All right, speaking of fantastic fillies and mares, uh, Randy, you had said last week that you thought Warlike Goddess was the best marathon mile and a half turf horse in America, and you were absolutely proved right in the Joe Hirsch Turf Classic, which he beat the males and beat them handily. And the thing that I especially liked about this race is that we finally saw her get the kind of trip that was favorable to her 
rather than unfavorable to her. And I give a lot of credit to Jose Lescano, who took over for Joel Rosario, who decided to ride at Keelan. Matter of fact, if I'm Belmont, I would keep Jose Lescano on the horse because this was the kind of ride that she hadn't been getting throughout her career. And they went the half in 48 and four, which in New York turf races is flying. That's like going 44 flat in a six furlong race in California, Zoe. Not only was she not last, she was third, only six lengths off the pace. She got the kind of setup that she wanted, no excuses whatsoever, like she had in her prior race uh, when she had that really, really tough go of it under Rosario. And she put on a show. Obviously, the Europeans are going to come over here and be super tough. But Randy, spot on good call among the American horses, female or male, that especially with Gufo not running well in this race at all, that are coming into the Joe, uh, excuse me, coming into the Breeders' Cup turf. She's certainly number one. And I can't even think of who would be number two at this point. Yeah. The first thing I noticed in the race, and I don't know if it was because of Lescano or maybe because Warlike Goddess is just, you know, getting more mature or whatever, but she was definitely more into the race early on. Before they even hit that first turn, she was only like about four lengths back. And I was like, wow. And then she settled and she dropped to about five and then six and then eight lengths back in the run through the stretch the first time. But, you know, clearly she was more engaged in the early part of the race than she had been in her other races. Ordinarily, she would have been way back there with uh, with Gufo and, and some of the other horses, Adamo, they were at the very, very back of the pack. So that's I think that bodes well for Warlike Goddess uh, moving forward. Um, yeah, Gufo was a complete no show. And, you know, we'll see, as you said, we'll see who they wind up uh, bringing over from Europe. Right now, it doesn't look like, when you look at what the Breeders' Cup is expecting, it doesn't look like uh, a super strong list of older horses, I mean, from uh, from Europe. Maybe the best one would be Broom, who looked like he had the Breeders' Cup turf won last year at Del Mar coming down the stretch before you beer went the last quarter in 22-4 and four and came flying and nailed Broom right on the wire. But Broom is the kind of horse that seems to really like a super firm turf course, like he got at Del Mar last year, that he gets rarely over in Europe. And in Lexington in November, I don't know if he's going to get that same kind of hear your feet rattle turf course that he got out in Del Mar. I would think the odds are uh, are, are pretty slim. Uh, Aiden's got another couple of horses that he's thinking about, you know, but it looks like there's not really – that A-list horse from Europe that we sometimes see come over here for the turf. Yeah, and I think she doesn't need to take her track with her. I thought it was key that she managed to sit close because I think a lot of things people don't take in is if you have a closer that can sit comfortably a little bit closer to the pace, she still had that punch. Now, she got to the lead a whole lot quicker than she has done in any of her races, and I think maybe she did idle just a little bit once she hit the front, but the punch is still there. The ability to close when you're sitting third or fourth is going to be huge for her, and she's shown she can do it. And that was my big thing, and I, I love the way that Lascano rode her. And, I mean, honestly, other than the faux pas by Joelle, he's ridden her very, very well indeed. I mean, sometimes you just can't help yourself when you get stuck in traffic like he got stuck in. But I love the fact that she was able to sit closer and close at the same time, because that's that's a, a big bullet in her holster for the Breeders' Cup. So I've got my sort of handy dandy early, early Breeders' Cup list here. I'll, I'll just skip through some names real quick. Besides Broom, uh, Coolmore's thinking about Stone Age, the three-year-old that came over to run in some of those uh, turf races in New York. You know, he's okay. He didn't win any of those races, ran decently, but you wouldn't think uh, Warlike Goddess would be shaking in her uh, in her boots there over uh, Stone Age. Uh, Mishriff from the Gosden Barn, who is maybe not quite running as effectively as he was a little earlier in his career. And Rebels Romance from the Godolphin Charlie Appleby Barn, who's got three wins in a row, the last two in Germany, including the grocer Pries von Baden. I hope I said that right. But you know, anytime, obviously, Charlie Appleby, like you be here last year, anytime Charlie Appleby sends a horse over uh, over here to run, whether it's a long shot or not, you've got to give it some extra consideration. That's Rebel's Romance. Just a reminder, the TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Keeneland. We are a month out from the Keeneland November sale. It will start on Monday, the 7th of November. 
Following the Breeders' Cup, a lot of talk about Breeders' Cup on this show. The catalog for that sale is now live, and there are 3,000, listen to this, Randy, 3,691 horses, including proven producers, broodmare prospects, and weanlings at all levels of the market. Then the racing, the horses of Racing Age sale will take place on Thursday, November the 17th. You can get proven runners right at Keeneland. We'll be right back from this message from Keeneland. When the thoroughbred world descends upon Lexington this November, there is one place you need to be. The place where history comes alive with every championship victory. He's on the dick indeed! The place where the future is built with the fall of a gavel. The place that exists to be the heart of this industry. The center of it all. Home to the November breeding stock sale and the 2022 Breeders' Cup, Keeneland. Spites Town. Bunning. Echo Town. It's Echo Town for Joe Talamo and Echo Town. Race the way. And Echo Town is drawing away in the stretch. Echo Town wins the Allen Jerkin Stakes. A sire line so prolific it repeats itself. Echo Town. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Just a reminder, Mendelssohn got his first graded stakes winner on Friday at Keeneland with delight in the grade two Jessamine, winning by more than five lengths, making it two in a row for the $400,000 OBS graduate. Coolmore also stands Justify. Had an exacta on Sunday right here at the Great Race Place, Santa Anita, with Arabian Lion, who earned a 92 by a speed figure, and was named a TDN Rising Star, as well as the Justify Sired second place finisher, Elwood Blues. Justify is now the sire of 18 winners this year. Pretty good, don't you think, Randy? Wouldn't you like to have a Justify in your barn? Yes. I'd have 10 of them if I could. How yes. <laughs> I'd have one. All right. So uh, let's pick back up with reviewing last weekend's races and let's go now to the, the division that's going to head now to the Breeders' Cup mile, the Coolmore mile. We said going in, I thought this was the most competitive race of the weekend. Just a terrific field, loaded stack. I didn't really see Annapolis because I'm a guy, I'd like to see a three year old do it against older horses this time of year before I'm ready to throw them into the deep end of the pool. But, you know, Todd Pletcher had the Midas touch over the weekend. Ivar ran okay to be second. Annapolis gets the win by a length and a half. Randy, can he, can he possibly upset modern games in the Breeders' Cup mile? We're all big modern games fans. Yeah. If modern games comes over and runs the same sort of race that he ran in the Woodbine mile, uh, I think everybody else is running for second money. And typically, Charlie Appleby horses come over here and they run their race when they come to the States. William Buick is great at riding those horses over here. So Modern Games is is definitely, I think, still the horse to beat. Maybe Todd will tell us in a little while what he told me uh, before this particular race. And that is that when he looked at the at the Coolmore Turf Mile, he saw what you pointed out. He saw a lot of, of he saw a very deep field. And what were very good horses, but in his words, no world beaters, no modern games type horses, no one, you know, no wise Dans or Teppins or anybody in there of that caliber to be uh, to be afraid of. So that's why he gave uh, he gave Annapolis, the three year old, a chance against the older horses. And he got the trip. He got a beautiful trip, the, the quintessential turf trip. Tucked right down on the inside. Uh, the pace was fairly fast, but not as quick as some of us had expected, since Classic Causeway didn't really materialize along the inside as being the horse that would run out there and force some super, super fast fractions. So Annapolis just set the trick, uh, set the trip, and then was tipped out at the top of the stretch and kicked very nicely, showed a nice turn of foot. You look at his form in hindsight now. Uh, he's lost twice. One of those races was at Penn National on what Pletcher, I think, correctly terms as a bottomless turf course. That day, the, the turf course was as soft uh, doing figures as I have ever seen uh, a turf course in, in America in which they still ran on and they didn't take the races off the turf. And he was beaten by a horse that you would think had absolutely no chance to beat him. And so I think that race is a complete throwout and he finished second anyway. 
And then uh, in one of those mile and three sixteenths races, uh, the, the three year old series in New York, I thought he got an unusually passive ride by Irad Ortiz going into the first turn. Instead of going forward, which is what Ortiz would typically do, he sort of idled a little bit and got himself squeezed back by two Europeans on both sides of him and lost a lot of position early in that race. And Annapolis was much further back than he was in the Coolmore Turf Mile. And, and I think that hurt his chances. And he still finished second to Nation's Pride, another Appleby horse, in that race anyway. So those are the only two races he shows on his form that he's lost. I was very impressed with the way he ran. You can make a case as trip guys always can, okay? He did save ground on both turns, okay? Ivar finished well as usual for second, was, was a little bit further outside during the running of the race than Annapolis was. So the Sheets guys and all that are probably going to give Ivar as good or maybe even a better figure than, than, uh, than Annapolis got. And the same with Casa Creed, who finished fourth, I believe, maybe fifth. I think he finished fourth. He was four wide on the first turn, three wide on the second turn, was beaten about two lengths. So the Sheets guys are going to do the same thing. They're going to have Casa Creed probably with a better number than Annapolis. But the thing about Annapolis compared to those two horses, he makes his own trip because of his tactical speed. He's almost always going to be placed better during the running of a race uh, than either Ivar or Casa Creed. Uh, Annapolis was terrific. And the thing I love about him is he's done it at Keeneland. Yes, he got beaten on bottomless turf. Now, I've ridden at Penn National on that turf course. I mean, that'll go up to your knees if you're not careful, careful when it's deep. So he handled it. He's never going to find turf like that at Keeneland in November. Yes, it's probably going to be a little bit softer than it's been, but his tactical speed is going to be key in this race, especially with the softer turf, because we've seen time and time again that front runners on softer turf courses, it's a little easier on them. One, they can slow it down, and they always do, and they can finish. And two, if you're behind horses on a soft turf course, you're stepping into the holes they've already made in front of you. I cannot tell you what a difference that makes to be on the lead and running over a fresh course than actually having footballs thrown at your face. So that is key, and I'm in agreement with Randy with Modern Games. Now, Modern Games has been declared, according to Charlie Appleby this morning, for Champions Day, which is this weekend at Asker. But they want to watch the weather because they are expecting some rain over there in England. And we'll have to wait and see whether he does indeed run or not. Because if he doesn't run, he'll be headed over here. But if he does, then we'll have to wait and see. Other than modern games, uh, Ralph Beckett has a horse called Ken Ross, who's running pretty well over there. Not modern games well, but he's, he's, uh, they're seriously considering making the trip. You'll get Order of Australia back again, according to the boys at Coolmore. But he doesn't seem to be quite the same horse since his uh, leg injury and his subsequent surgery, although he ran pretty well with a good trip uh, to finish third at Coolmore. And then don't leave that smooth like straight. Uh, he'll be back in the Breeders' Cup mile if all goes well. He had a cut on his knee that swelled up at Keeneland uh, the, the night before the morning of the Coolmore Turf Mile. So he had to be scratched. Looking at the Breeders' Cup mile field, a race in which he finished second last year behind Space Blues, a good second. He controlled the pace last year, and it looks like on paper there's not a ton of early speed expected for the mile this year. So he may be in a similar situation again, uh, if all goes well between now and then. Philly and Mayer turf division over the weekend. No surprise, of course, dominated by Chad Pletcher. Two preps for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayer turf up in Canada. The E.P. Taylor won by Rogier. I'm glad we don't have bet fair in this country because I would have bet as much money as I could get my hands on for Rogier to lose that race. She had been so dull since her the U.S. debut, what was back in, um, I don't even remember the race, but she was running three straight, just really dull races. She beat Mora, who ran well, would have been disqualified if she won the race because she was taken down from second for uh, b bothering a Chad Brown horse deep in the stretch. Then the first lady stakes at Keeneland. Chad Brown won for the fifth straight year, one, two within Italian first, Regal Glory second. One thing about the first lady, though, it, it seems to me, it, it was, even though it's the Philly and Mayer grass division, it was a mile race getting horses ready for a mile and three sixteenths, which is a little bit unusual. Um, so they're going to have to extend out in the distance quite a bit. I'd even wonder if maybe Chad Brown might take one of those fillies and maybe look at the Breeders' Cup mile because, you know, he's, he's so loaded for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayer turf. They do want to spread the wealth around. But um, 
Randy, what'd you make of those performances from the Phillies and Mayors head to the grass? Well, that's exactly what Chad's thinking about. He's, it, the plan right now is to run in Italian in the Philly and Mayor turf, thinking that she can get a clear lead and that a mile and three sixteenths uh, should be within her wheelhouse. And looking at the way she ran uh, this past weekend, I, I don't blame him at all. I, I think she would have to be considered a contender to, to carry her speed. And Regal Glory, he's going to run back against the boys again in the Breeders' Cup mile. So he's he's thinking the same thing. And as usual, Zoe, Chad is loaded. Absolutely. I'm still thinking about Bill's comment about Chad Pletcher. I mean, he got, uh, so he'd be unbeatable. Like, I'm like, Chad Pletcher. Oh, my God. Who is this trainer? It's going to be champion dirt, champion tough. But, I wasn't um, going to say anything. I was going to let that slide, Bill. But. All right, I'm Bill. glad you did because a little levity never hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the How biggest about Tom story. Brown? That, yeah, the biggest story Another we can one. take. Take away from the EP Taylor is is Rouge and getting the win, but then you have Moira first time on the grass. Um, the TDN wrote a, a great column on Donato Lani, who's still absolutely furious with Rafael Hernandez, who took her inside, took her outside, cut off someone else, and basically got her DQ'd from second to eighth. So. I think perhaps Rougier's triumph overshadowed by Mora, who, of course, was the Queen's Plate winner. Yeah, she did definitely ran a good race. Okay, so one more division to look at. It's not a very sexy one, but the turf sprint division. But when Golden Pal's in action, you got to pay attention. He won the Woodford, got 106 buyer. It seemed to me as long as the races are not overseas, this horse is virtually unbeatable. I didn't love him either. I thought I kind of took a wise guy stand against him. I didn't like his last race at Saratoga. What was it, the Troy Stakes? I thought it was kind of, you know, he didn't dominate the field so much. But boy, he's back. He's good. Wesley Warder says this is the best horse he's ever trained, and he's backing it up on the racetrack. Workman-like. The time was good. The time was very, very good. And I think a lot of people have kind of, been a little bit down on him because everyone's expecting him to win by 10. He won comfortably. He stopped the clock in 55.15. And if you look at his whole body of work, he only had three works leading into that since his last. So he's got a very spotty work tab. Wesley knows exactly how to get him there and exactly what to do. And I'm not sure we did see the best golden pal that day. Maybe we'll never see the best one again, but it certainly was good enough. And it's likely to be good enough again, but there are some Euros coming over as well. Highland Princess, she took down the nun for, for John Quinn. She is going to be ultimately the one to beat in the Brutus Cup sprint. She Zoe, is if you call that race workmanlike, you're a tough critic. I got to tell you. I thought I it was am. better than that. Uh, it was I like like the time was good. The time was really good. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking anything away from him. He had a right to get tired. He had three works since his last race, basically right. one a month. And I know Wesley gallops him around in the back 40 out there. So, you know, he got him primed, but the goal was the goal is the Breeders' Cup. This is a stepping stone to the Breeders' Cup for Golden Pal. I, I wasn't that blown away by it either, Bill. Uh, and okay. I came away. My initial take of that race from that race would be that if there's anyone that that I think is up to the task, this would be a good bet against opportunity when you get to the turf sprint. But I'm a fan of Golden Pal, and I hope Zoe is right, and I can see her being right, that Wesley used this race only as a means to an end and wasn't, you know, didn't have Golden Pal fully cranked up from a workout perspective uh, going into this race, uh, and that maybe, you know, there'll be a whole lot more left in the tank uh, when he gets to Keeneland, or when he, you know, gets to the uh, gets to the turf sprint. But I, yeah, I, well, it was, I thought it was a workmanlike win. I, I, it, it, I didn't think it That's was bad. as flashy as some of the Golden Pal wins that we've seen in the past. Okay. Maybe well, I'm too tough. Covers all the big, that covers all the big weekend races. One more thing I want to talk about was what had actually occurred September 9th at Del Mar, a horse by the name of Bolts Broad, trained by uh, from the Ruiz Racing, won a maiden race that, uh, that day. And now, lo and behold, it comes out. There's a ruling against Drayden Van Dyke. The horse is disqualified because he hit the horse 10 times with the whip. That's over the limit. And if you hit 10 times, the, that's under HISA rules, that's an automatic disqualification. First time a horse has been disqualified in California for that, um, for that violation. I, I am an anti-whip guy, but I'll say this much. I don't like this rule 
for a couple of reasons that I think you either should have no whipping or do whatever the hell you want. I, you know, it's, it's, this is too convoluted. It's like saying, you know, it's like you're either half pregnant or you're pregnant. You either can whip the horses or you can't. I can't see the, the, the general public saying, oh, you only hit the horse six times. That's fine. But you hit him 10 times. Oh, isn't that horrible? That's my take on it. My other take, and we talked about this before though, but there's no gray area here. It's a rule. And if you violate the rule, you're going to get disqualified and it shouldn't be that hard for jockeys to count to 10. I mean, in, in the midst of a race, yes, I, I can see that it is. I think he hit, he hit the horse 11 times and the ruling is six. So he's almost double over the limit. Um, I'm fine as a former jockey, penalize the jock. My biggest takeaway from this is the owners, the guys that are paying the way for the sport are being penalized. And that's basically my problem. I'm not anti-whipping. I'm not pro-whipping. I don't like seeing horses beaten up by any means. But I think the problem comes when we're penalizing the owners, the people that are putting their hard-earned money into this sport. Uh, I, I don't really have an answer for it. If I did, I would say it right now. So I think some of this may be amended. And uh, we'll we'll go from there. I mean, Drayden got fired. I th fined, uh, I think, a thousand dollars and took his days already. So he's been penalized. But I'm not a big believer in penalizing the people that put the game on, and that is the owners and the gamblers. Well, I got a little different take on this. Uh, I don't like to see owners penalized either. Uh, especially owners don't like to see owners penalized. So I think that is going to make jockeys more careful in trying to follow the whip rules, knowing that in a circumstance like this, if they don't, their owner will have his purse taken away. If, I think what we have to ask ourselves, we, we, we've got to be logical about this. Do we want a whip rule? Okay. I agree with Bill that there, you know, no whips would be okay, but jockeys clearly don't like that. So the whip is obviously going to be here to stay, at least for the immediate future. So if you have the whips, I think most of us would agree that you need some kind of a whip rule to keep jockeys from going crazy and Victor Espinosa from hitting American Pharaoh 32 times in the stretch run of the Kentucky Derby. OK, now, if you have a whip rule, though, and the only the only penalty for a jockey is a three day suspension or a five day suspension or a thousand dollar fine or a five thousand dollar fine. Hell, if you're at the top of the stretch in a $1 million race, why wouldn't you beat the horse if you think that's what it right. takes to get the horse to win if it's just going to be a little minor slap on the wrist? So I think the only way you can get enforcement that really has teeth, that really causes a change in behavior of these riders is to do something like this and to take the purse away from the owner as much as we hate to see it happen. Yeah, Randy, I'm in agreement with you on that. I, I think that if you're going to have the rule and I've got, you know, the, look, there's no easy solution to this. I think all three of us no. agree on that. But if you're going to have this rule, it does have to have teeth. I'll say another thing, too. I mean, this was just a maiden race at, at Del Mar on September. I think there was a race in New Mexico recently where uh, the same thing happened. It was a stakes race there. But can you imagine the the fuss and the kerfuffle and, and the, you know, just Twitter rage there's going to be? What if this happens in the Breeders' Cup? And, you know, you're going to disqualify a horse from the Breeders' Cup and you're going to have to if the jockey it's 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 after six, you're some sort of penalty from seven to, to nine and then 10 on. According to the HISA rules, you are disqual The horse is disqualified. And, you know, I would imagine, Zoe, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, in the heat of the moment in the Breeders' Cup, I mean, maybe jockeys would be even more inclined. Hey, I'm riding for six million dollars here. And, you know, all they can focus on is doing their very best to get the horse to win. But, you know, I think this has the potential to blow up if it happens in a, in a race like that or in a triple crown race or even anything at the grade one level to be a, you know, we think it's a controversy now. Can you just imagine if this happens in the Breeders' Cup Classic with, uh, I don't, you know, Flavian Pratt, I can't imagine there's going to be a situation where he's going to have to hit flight line 10 times. But just imagine if something like that happens in one of these races. Oh, my God, is the you know what can hit the fan. It's going to have to be talked about. And pre-Breeders' Cup, they're going to have to sit down and talk to the jocks. And there's going to be a lot of discussions about this leading up to Breeders' Cup because you don't want to be having a post-Breeders' Cup with a what-if. You need 
a, a pre-breeder's cup with a what if. The TD and Riders Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association and the Kentucky Thoroughbred Association. As usual, Kentucky breads dominated nearly all of the grade one races from coast to coast over this past weekend. We'll be right back after this message from the KTOB. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all-time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Brents, breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. Connect, the next in line to carry on Lane's End's tried and true stallion tradition. A grade one winning millionaire son of Curlin, physically impressive and dominant on the track. Winner of the grade one Cigar Mile and the grade two Pennsylvania Derby, where he defeated Gunrunner, Nyquist, and Exaggerator. With multiple six-figure yearlings in his first crop, up to $360,000. Connect, a proven winner on the track, a proven stallion in the making. Lane's End Stallion of the Week is Connect, a grade one winning son of Red Hot Sire Curlin, previously the sire of horses like Rattle and Roll and Hidden Connection. Connect was recently represented by Camino de Santiago, who finished third in the Fitz Dixon Memorial Juvenile at Presque Isle Downs last weekend, as well as Battle Strike, who ran third in the Cup and Saucer at Woodbine for Canadian Fold two-year-olds over the weekend. Connect stands for a fee of $25,000 at Lane's End. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. Well, we're pleased to welcome the Green Group Guest of the Week. Now, Todd Pletcher coming off a fantastic weekend. The Bell Dame, the Spinster, the uh, Breeders Futurity with Forte, the Annapolis win in the Coolmore Turf Mile. Uh, Todd, lining up what you have for the Breeders' Cup now, the horses I mentioned, you also have, of course, Life is Good, Chocolate Gelato, Major Dude. I'm sure I'm leaving out three or four others that deserve mention. Is this the best Breeders' Cup lineup you've ever had? Well, at this point, it certainly seems like it could be. Um... You know what you always worry about. It's it's a it's a difficult balancing act for for some of these to decide how much time you want from their final prep to the big event, and so that's why we kind of wrestled with the decision whether or not to run Nest in the Bell Dame and have her final prep. You know, only twenty seven days out. Hopefully, we got what we wanted, which was a, a good race without overdoing it and leaving something in the tank. But yeah, I mean, it, it's you know we couldn't be more pleased with uh, with the group we have at the moment. Todd, if the Breeders' Cup were being run this weekend, take us through your uh, what who your starters would be. Well, for the uh, juvenile turf, we have Major Dude. For the juvenile fillies, we have Chocolate Gelato. For the distaff, we have Nest and Malathot. For the classic, we have Life is Good and Happy Saver. For the turf mile, Annapolis. Um, for the juvenile Colts Forte. And we haven't ruled out the idea of running Lost Ark. I think he, you know, if you go back and look at the Breeders' Futurity, he had a very, very difficult trip. And <clears throat> I'm proud of him for continuing to run on late because I think a lot of horses would have thrown in the towel with the, with the trip that he got. So, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at uh, right now at the moment. Todd, who's been your biggest surprise? Because a lot of people may have been surprised to see the son of Bolt Doro um, in the Pilgrim Major Dude. Was that a surprise when you first put him on the turf course at Belmont in the mornings, how well he handled it? It did surprise us a little bit, but, you know, he kind of fit the profile of a horse that maybe wasn't on the right surface. I mean, he looks like a dirt horse. He trained like a dirt horse and he wasn't quite polishing off his races the way we expected so when we gave him a breeze on the turf you know he said wow it looks like he likes it and so that's why we decided to to give it a try of course on the day of the pilgrim the the turf course was pretty soft we were concerned about that but you know he seemed to handle it really well 
Uh, Todd, let's go back to the classic and we'll start with that. He said, happy saver. And of course, life is good. The good news about life is good as Woodward was he did what he was supposed to do. He went out there. He won the race. It was reasonably comfortable in the last hundred yards or so. But the wow factor seemed to be missing a little bit. The buyer number was a 97. I guess maybe we've all been spoiled by this horse because we're used to go, him going out and putting in electric performance. Enough of what I uh, thought about the race. What did you think about it? Well, it was the only two-turn race of the day. It was run on a sloppy track that was changing throughout the day. Um, I'm, I'm not, honestly, I don't really know if the buyer figure is correct or not. I think if you look at Thurograph or Ragazin, he ran much faster than that. He went the final three eights and 36 and one, which is pretty hard to do no matter what the circumstances are. I think Law Professor ran probably the best race of his life, and it was another 10 links back to keep me in mind. So, look. He didn't win by 15 links like Flightline did or however many he won by. So I think that's kind of the comparison that everyone was looking for. But, you know, we're running back in five weeks. And uh, so we wanted to be ready to run, be ready to win. Also being thoughtful that we had five weeks to the, to the Classic. Well, Todd, you pointed out that the recipe for success in the Woodward, nice and relaxed all the way to the top of the lane, respond to law professor, finish the last quarter in 24 and one might not be the same strategy that would work the best in the Breeders' Cup Classic against Flightline. So give us your idea of the best case scenario for life is good in the Classic when he goes up against Flightline. Well, that's that's what's going to be difficult to, uh, you know, to determine and, and uh Look, Flightline's a spectacular horse. We know that. We also know that life is good. His weapon is his speed and his ability to, to go fast and keep going. So what I'm looking forward to really is hopefully getting him on a track for the first time in a while that's a really fast track, you know, a, a true, true glib surface. You know, when we ran at Aqueduct, the, the entire meet, the Aqueduct track has been very slow. We got that rain um, first time on a sloppy track for him. Prior to that, you ran at Saratoga, same thing, very deep, demanding track, weather that day, they'd sealed the track, they'd harrowed the track. It was, it was not a fast surface. And, and certainly in Dubai, we caught, you know, really, really deep, demanding surface. So I'm hoping at Keeneland that we get, you know, a fast, hopefully in his case, a speed favoring type track that, uh, you know, be kind of the first time that he's able to have a track that plays to his strengths. Todd, do you think people have forgotten how fast life is good really is? Because we saw him initially out here on the West Coast and you've done a fantastic job of, you know, slowing him down in the mornings. But do you think people have forgotten that this horse really is just so fast? I mean, that's one of his weapons. Yeah, I, I think if you if you look back to see how fast he is, we go to the Alan Jerkins last year when he opened up several links on Jackie's warrior right out of the gate, you know, I, he's already proven that he can win the dirt mile. I think he's the type of horse that could win the breeders cup sprint. And we're also hoping he's the kind of horse that could win the breeders cup classic. So truly, you know, a horse that you could enter in three different races on the, on the card and have a legitimate chance. Nice problem. Well, let's turn I'm sorry. Go ahead, Zoe. I said, that's a nice problem to have. Right. For sure. All right. So, Todd, let's turn our attention now to the distap. Well, you'll have the two favorites in the wagering, Nest and Malathat. And never in a million years would you answer the question, who's better? So I'm going to try to just be kind of cute here. In your mind, do you have a theory? Do you have an opinion which you might not want to share? Is one better than the other? Or is that going to be determined, obviously, uh, at Keeneland in three and a half weeks? It's it's very interesting to me because I truly don't know which one is better. Um, I think they're both spectacular fillies. Um, so much in common, being Curlins out of AP and D mares, terrific dispositions, easy to train. Um, you know, I think the, the one difference that we know that maybe not everyone else can see is that Malathot tends to run to her competition a little bit. And she, she's, she, she knows when she makes the lead. She tends to idle when she does. So... Her last race, and I think the tempted were really the only two times that she she demolished the field. And uh, 
she has a, like I said, a tendency to kind of think when she gets her head in front that it's, it's uh, game over. So her form looks a little bit different uh, because she doesn't have those blowout margins like Ness does. And Ness, Ness has that unique ability to, to cruise, but then quicken as well. And kind of like we saw in the Alabama, the coaching club, even the other day in the Bell Dame, it's like she's head and head, head and head, and then boom, she's five in front. And uh, so it'll be interesting, you know, to see how the race unfolds, how much pace is in there. And I think Maltha would probably be in a position where she's going to have to get to nest at some point. So also Saturday, the Claiborne Breeders Futurity, uh, Forte dug deep to uh, to hold off Loggins, who kept fighting back along the inside. Uh, a game win for Forte. In your opinion, how much of an advantage is it now that you're going to be up against Cave Rock and maybe National Treasure from the Bob Baffert barn to have a two turn race at Keeneland under Forte's belt? Well, that, that's why we ultimately decided to go there is to get that two turn experience and get a race over the track. And it's great now that we know that he handled that, got that experience and, and, and seemingly liked the surface. So um, I think that's all that's an advantage. Um, I think he's working, you know, a little bit against the grain of the track. He closed well. He's as far back as eight, turning up the backside, made up some ground as they went along the way. And, and then I think a little bit, got a little bit green the last part, kind of wanted to lay on that horse next to him a little bit. And, and I read kind of spent the last 60 or 70 yards correcting him as opposed to riding him forward. So hopefully, uh, you know, that experience makes him a little more professional next time. What were the thoughts going through your head when they hung up the inquiry objection? I mean, it, it was very close. They were going back with some forwards down the lane. I thought the horse on the inside logins was very, very game in defeat. But what were your thoughts when they they hung it up initially? Was were there any concerns? Look, anytime you have an inquiry, there's there's plenty of concerns. <laughs> and, uh, Especially a team one. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I've, I've seen the race the day before that, that you know, I didn't think they'd take the winner down and they did. So, you know, you just, you, you don't know. I, I, I truly believe they made the, the right call. And I'd say that even if they took us down or what, but, um, you know, I, I, I think they, they, they came together, neither rider or certainly the, the inside horse never had to stop riding, never lost momentum. I, I don't think it affected the outcome of the race. Todd, I can't believe I'm saying this because it's a Todd Pletcher horse. It's won two straight grade one races, but he was surprisingly not the favorite to me in the Breeders' Futurity. Uh, the public, the betting public jumped all over Loggins. Now, when you get to, uh, well, when you get back to Keeneland yourself with the horse is staying there, um, all the talk is going to be about Cave Rock. Is this horse flying under the radar a little bit? I think he could be. I mean, I, you know, I've seen that Cave Rock will likely be the biggest favorite on the card and rightfully so. I mean, he's, he's, demolished everything that he's run against and uh you know it's been ultra impressive so i'm hoping there's an honest pace you know maybe somebody to entertain him if they're fast enough to do that and uh you know i mean forte is a horse that we've liked a lot from the very beginning he's always trained trained like a really good colt and uh you know so yeah he's flying under the radar a little bit but uh i think at the end of the day he jumped up and did really well wouldn't surprise anyone so other than the distaff, this is like a common theme. I mean, life is good as a super good horse, but everybody's talking about flight line. Uh, Forte is obviously a nice horse. Everybody's talking about Bob Efforts Cave Rock. Annapolis, a really nice horse, as we saw in the Coolmore Turf Mile. And yet Modern Games is going to be the heavy favorite probably in that race uh, if, if, he, if it all winds up going well between now and then. What were your thoughts on Annapolis's win and what characteristics does he have that you think – will help him against modern games? Well, you know, what I liked about it is he put himself in a really good spot early on. The fractions were solid, but he was, he was attending the pace. He was in a good spot. He, uh, he was able to accelerate when he found that seam. So, you know, he kind of did everything that you would, uh, you would hope one, one would do to be successful in, in a race like that. Like you said, now we're going to have to meet a horse like modern games who was, ultra impressive at, at Woodbine and, you know, one last year in the juveniles. So we, we know that the competition is going to be deep, but, you know, for first time against older horses and getting a race over the track and like, we couldn't have asked him to do anything uh, more than he did. 
Todd, is it now that you take a little bit of a breath leading up? Because we've had all the win in your ends. Last weekend, you had 10 horses running. You won five of them, three grade ones. Is it time to take a breath or now are you just tightening the screws? I mean, it seems like you're everywhere. You're either on a plane flying backwards and forwards. Like, what, what do you do? Do you, do you breathe now or do you hold your breath until the Breeders' Cup? In, in this business, you hold your breath 24-7 regardless of what time of year it is. But uh, no, I mean, look, we're, we're really pleased with, uh, you know, the way the horses ran, the way they came out of it. Now, next three and a half weeks here on pins and needles, just, you know, hoping everyone stays healthy and trains accordingly. And then you'll be watching the weather like crazy, trying to make sure you get your works in on fast tracks when you hopefully on the days that, that you have them scheduled for so, yeah, no, it's um, it's certainly uh, no time to breathe. But, you know, I, I will say this for for life is good running in the classic and a flight line runs in there. It's going to be the first time that we've run him that he wasn't a huge favorite. He wasn't expected to win. So I might actually get to enjoy watching the race for a change. <laughs> you were even in Wake Forest on Saturday for parents weekend with Hannah. So maybe you should go to Wake Forest every weekend. Huh? <laughs> might not be a bad idea. <laughs> Uh, Todd, among the many horses you have, we've talked about the ones like Malathat and Nestor are going to be expected to do really well. Do you have a sleeper? Do you, who among your horses is going to, you think is going to run beyond expectations? Well, I mean, I, I think Happy Saver is a horse that, that, you know, always shows up, tries hard, got, got a rough trip in the, in the race at Churchill. You know, I, I, I'm flirting with the idea of, of trying blinkers on him for the first time, just to, to kind of renew some enthusiasm. We'll see how he breezes with those. But, uh, you know, to me, he's a horse that, that always shows up, tries hard, runs well. And if, you know, things were to get crazy up front and they go way too fast, him, you know, picking up some pieces. And I don't know if he could win the whole thing, but I think he could get a chunk of it. Podcast is, is sponsored by Keeneland. I saw an awful lot of you at Keeneland and your wife, Trey, Tracy, and the whole Rapoli contingent. I think they bought half the sale up. How was that experience for you being there? Keeneland week. I mean, you're there at most sales, but it just seems like Rapoli is just buying more and more and they're going to Top Pletcher. You were there all week. Your wife, Tracy, was there all week for the first time. How was that experience for you? being at Keeneland, being part of that team? Well, I mean, we're, we're blessed. It's, you know, we go to the Keeneland September sale every year, and this is one of the only times that we've went and, and had the buying power like Mike and Vinny Viola had. And, and uh, you know, so we've been there in, in some years where you do all of this leg work and, and then you, you come out with very few horses. In this case, we came out with quite a few and, you know, to me, it's 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 the greatest jigsaw puzzle around. You know, you're 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 looking at a lot of horses in a short period of time, and you're trying to figure out which ones uh, which ones you want and which ones you can get. And, and uh, you know, I, I really enjoy the process, but it is it is tedious. And then, and Mike was there for three or four of the days, and uh, he holds a different uh, sleep schedule than I do, so the, the dinners went quite a bit later than uh, I'm used to. How did Tracy enjoy it? Because you guys were pounding the payment, pavement, 30 horses, 27 in partnerships. That was a lot of horses. And, and Tracy was like the happiest of everybody there. <laughs> yeah, no, she was, uh, she was a great help. And, uh, you know, she was going out in front and getting some hip numbers out, hip, hips out for us. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's a fun process and, and, and also, you know, a lot of work at the same time, but we, we, uh, you know, with Mike and his team there and some of his buddies, we we had a lot of fun doing it, too. Well, Todd, thanks so much for joining us. Best of luck at the Breeders' Cup. Could be a great two days for your stable. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. And as this week's Guest of the Week, Todd Pletcher will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. And with all his horses, boy, couldn't that come in handy. Learn more at www.greenco.com. And we'll be right back after this message from The Green Group.
Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by XBTV. The workout of the week is, of course, Flightline working this past Saturday in 112 and change under one labor for trainer John Sadler. You can check out all XBTV's workouts on XBTV.com. Not only the greatest tool in horse racing, you can go back and see how horses look before, and then you can look how they look now. XBTV.com is the only place to go. And this is the TDN Writers Room Weekend Preview brought to you by Three Chimneys. As you might expect, a very quiet weekend after the big Breeders' Cup races were run last weekend. Only a handful of major races, only a couple uh, graded stakes races, only one grade one race on the calendar this weekend, at least when it comes to flat racing. That is the Queen Elizabeth Challenge Cup at Keeneland. And the headliner will be McCulloch for who else but Chad Brown going for his fifth win overall in the race that, like most turf races, uh, stakes races, he has just dominated over the years. He also has Gina Romantica in there. McCulloch will be a heavy favorite in that race. Looks like on paper in a seven-horse field, he will be very tough to beat. One of the reasons why she'll be a heavy favorite is Pizza Bianca, who apparently was going to run in this race, or at least that's what um, was kind of the conventional wisdom coming into the weekend, uh, was not entered and instead will be entered in was entered in the Sands Point at Belmont and Aqueduct. Jose Ortiz will ride. Now, she has not run since the Coronation Cup back in June at Royal Ascot, where she finished eighth. But no, no let's not forget what kind of filly this is for Bobby Flay and Christophe Clement. And she won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies last year, at, of course, at Del Mar. Will either one of these fillies come back in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Turf? Probably not. Is generally the three-year-old fillies that run the three weeks out from the Breeders' Cup don't come back in the Breeders' Cup. We don't have a big history of that. But McCulloch at Keeneland, Pizza Bianca at Belmont at Aqueduct, among the three-year-old filly division, should be a very interesting week of racing. Expect the two big guns to probably both get in the winner's circle. Uh, back to McCulloch's race, uh, there's a couple other uh, new faces in there, one of which is Paris Peacock. This is an interesting starter. She comes in from Ireland for trainer Jessica Har Harrington, has won two grade three over there, group threes over there. I think she'll deserve some respect, as will Bella Bell, who was second last time out in the grade one Delmar Oaks uh, at Delmar, of course, trained by Phil D'Amato, who, like Chad Brown, just excels with fillies on the grass. So an interesting weekend of racing from that perspective. There is one other uh, race of some note. It's at Keeneland on Friday. It's called uh, the Sycamore Stakes, grade three for a mile and a half. And I say that only because, I mean, Mira Mission, seven to two, Arklow's four to one. We could get a starter out of the Breeders' Cup turf from that. But the horse I'm going to be pulling for is Channel Maker, an yes. eight-year-old, right? So far in the history of the Breeders' Cup, the following horses have had five Breeders' Cup starts. Better Talk Now, California Flag, Forense Fire, Kona Gold, obviously Perfect Drift, and Channel Maker. Channel Maker, if he wins this race impressively enough, and he's eight to one, that he convinces uh, his connections to give him another try in the Breeders' Cup turf. And he was the top American finisher last year at Del Mar in the Breeders' yes. Cup turf. He finished fifth. He would be the first horse ever to compete in six different Breeders' Cups. One juvenile turf, and the rest of them have been Breeders' Cup turf. So that's kind of a cool Didn't story. Run well in 2020 as well. And third. 
Yeah, I always laugh with trainer Bill Mott because he's got a very high headed way of going. And I'm like, yes. you know, he drowned in a rainstorm. <laughs> and he was like, a, let's just hope it doesn't rain during the race because he literally runs with his head up in the air. So it just shows you it, it takes all kinds of different kind of movements. So just because a horse is high headed doesn't mean they're not a good one. Now, I'm going to throw you guys what is admittedly a trick question. There is oh. another grade one thoroughbred race this weekend. Anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? The jumpers, guys, come on. I know oh, jump sure. fans out there. Um, but no, actually, this is kind of a neat thing because on Friday, excuse me, on Saturday at Far Hills is the Grand National Steeplechase, which is the premier steeplechase race run in, in, in America. And it is a rematch between Snap Decision, who will likely be the Eclipse Award winner this year among jumpers, and Noah and the Ark. Noah and the Ark beat Snap Decision by nine lengths last time out in the Lonesome Glory Stakes at um, Saratoga. But that day, because it was a handicap race, Snap Decision gave him 28 pounds. He carried 168, and uh, Noah and the Ark carried 140, 168 pounds. Obviously, it was too much. This is a wait-for-age race. They will both carry 156 so expect to see snap decision snap back into the winner circle. There's also on the card the first ever running, and this is near and dear to my heart. Somebody was very meaningful to all of us at the TDN, John Forbes, who passed away uh, last year. They have named a two mile turf race on the flat, the John Forbes Memorial at Far Hills, with a hundred thousand dollar purse. And there's actually some normal, well, I'm not calling jump jockeys abnormal. But there are some mainstream flat jockeys riding in this race. So their uh, horses are carrying like 148. They're going against the jump guys. So somebody who weighs 112 pounds would have to carry what, like a 36 pounds of dead weight, a uh, lead weight in their saddle pad. I, I, I can't get any response to the, 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 the jump races Saturday, guys. No. I well, love that decision. Didn't. Didn't women like sweep the card at a jump race meeting last week? Because it's it seems like they because you got Kerry Bryan basically taking charge now. I think they won like seven of the nine races at a jump meet last week. It's like go women, go. Like they are winning <laughs> everything on the jump schedule right now. I so spent- I have no answer that beats me. <laughs> uh Bill, I spent two racing days this March, courtesy of Mr. Michael Dickinson, at Cheltenham. Right. So I now have a new appreciation for jump racing. And also way back in the day when I was with ESPN, uh, we did the Breeders' Cup steeplechase from Far Hills. One of the more enjoyable afternoons at a racetrack that I think Mm -hmm. I've ever spent. What a beautiful Mm -hmm. part of New Jersey. Right. And if I can take you down memory lane, if I'm not mistaken, I think Bill Finley made an appearance on that ESPN telecast to talk about the steeplechase horses. Did I? I'm getting old. I don't remember. Michael Dickinson, by the way, has a horse in the two mile flat race um, with a hundred thousand dollar purse. So there is actually a stakes race with some decent money for the normal flat horses on the card. Hey, uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about the Breeders' Cup Classic. But first, these messages from one of our sponsors, Three Chimneys. Here comes Tama. Tama in the center of the track with good looking stride. Squares off with Cyberknife. Cyberknife takes the lead. Tama going with him. These two in a thriller. Cyberknife just in front. And Cyberknife has won the TVG.com Haskell over Tama. Jack Christopher finished third. The running time, 1 minute 46.24 seconds. Come dream with us at Three Chimneys. Welcome back. Well, there were no preps over the weekend for the Breeders' Cup Classic, but this would be a good time, again, to rehash the race. Obviously, the story is Flightline. I thought it was interesting. Ed DeRosa, who's a real good handicapper, works for Horse Racing Nation, used to work for Brisnet, put out a a morning line for the Breeders' Cup Classic. And when you first look at it, you would think that uh, he's kind of out of his mind. But then on second thought, I'm going to explain why I think Ed's uh, straight on here. He's got Flightline at three to five. Now, if flight line is going to be three to five and what's going to be a 10 or 11 horse field, there's not going to be a five to two, three to one shot behind him. This is his line. Flight line three to five, epicenter 12 to one, Taba 15 to one, life is good 20 to one, Olympiad 30 to one, Hot Rod Charlie 40 to one, and we keep going. Randy, wow. can we possibly see in the Breeders' Cup horses as good as epicenter and Taba 
going off maybe not at 12 to one, but at 10 to one? I I would have a you know, I've made a lot of lines in my day. I I would have a tough time seeing a horse as good as Epicenter as the second choice in the Breeders' Cup Classic and double digits on the odds board. Uh, to me, if for some reason flight line doesn't show as he usually does, or maybe he runs a really good race, but just nowhere close to the race he ran in the Pacific Classic, to me, the only horse in the field on paper that would have a chance to beat him is Epicenter, who I think is really headed in the right direction. And obviously, a uh, mile and a quarter is right up uh, is right up his alley. But that, that would be really surprising. Well at Keeneland. He worked really well at Keeneland, I think, either yesterday or this morning with Clarier, who'll go forward in the distaff. So he's he's coming in. I mean, everyone's under the radar apart from Flightline right now. But Epicenter is good, and he's been stable there. And Steve knows how to get these horses ready to dance the big dance on the big day. He's so good at that. Randy, I think you're selling Tabo a little bit short. I mean, I don't think Flightline's going to lose, but you know, from a handicapping standpoint, uh, probably what a lot of us are going to do is try to figure out who's going to run second, maybe second and third, second, third, and fourth for the um, Superfecta. Now, I have immense respect for Epicenter. He very well could be second, but I'm a Taba fan. I, I mean, I love this race in the Pennsylvania Derby. As I said, coming into that race and coming out of it, I don't think that we, you know, I think we're just now seeing the very best of this horse. And, you know, he, he was behind the eight ball the way they had to rush him into the Kentucky Derby. And now Baffert has done a really good job getting him back, getting him to his best. You know, he he ran the best race of his life in the Pennsylvania Derby. And, um, you know, I think that he can even improve off that race. So I'm a Taba fan. I mean, if you, you know, make me make a, a pick right now or a betting strategy, it would be a flight line over Taba exacta. But um, I, I obviously I have a lot of uh respect for epicenter uh, zoe who's going to be second if flight line is first who's going to be second in the breeders cup class it's going to be close i mean i can't talk you off a of Tabor at all i can't talk you off of epicenter i think the thing that we need to look into is the penultimate works coming up this weekend for these horses because that is the telling i'm pretty sure flight line's gonna put a zinger in there Tabor will have to wait and see what he does because Bob's penultimate works are so, so important to him. We've seen time and time again, oh, he's not going. I didn't put him on the plane. I didn't like how he acted. And that's basically Bob going from day to day. But Tabor's a very, very good horse. Epicenter always shows up, doesn't always win, but he's always right there. If you don't have him in your top three, you are going to be in trouble for sure. Zoe, a question about Tabor's works. They've been not slow, but they haven't been breaking the stopwatch. You know, just this 12, 12, 12, you look down, he goes a minute. Do you see a 58 coming out of this horse? Is that just not John Sadler's style? Uh, 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 Tabor or flight no, line? No, I'm sorry, flight line. Oh, flight line? Well, I mean, he worked 12 and change. Uh, I think they're going to tighten the screws this weekend. He worked 12 and change last weekend, and he'll probably do the same. Uh, he always works solo. He doesn't have to do a whole lot. And he has a good gallop out. So he might do it by accident. I don't see him asking for that kind of work. As far as Tabor, Tabor's not a good workhorse. I mean, he's not. By Bob Baffert's standards, this isn't a horse who's going to take you down there in 58 and change with the jock's feet on the dashboard. If he is, you better go all in on Tabor because he's not the prettiest horse to watch in the morning. He's got a good way of going, but the rider has to ask him. He'll only do as much as you ask him. And that marks for a good horse. He's certainly not a runoff or a standout in the mornings by any means. If he works in 101 and the jock's sitting up there with his feet on the dashboard, that's really good. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. We're all talking about flight line. It's flight line, flight line, flight line. Just imagine standing in the winner's circle at Keeneland watching flight line walk in. That can happen to you for a fraction of the cost. Learn more at westpointtb.com. We'll be right back after these messages from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life. Make new friends and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. 
Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The TD and Riders Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think 50 years of combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tom or Wendy a call. They personally advise you on each horse as if that horse were their own. And the Phasic Tipton Kentucky October yearling sale, just two weeks away, has almost 50 yearlings that Legacy has cataloged, including first crop sires represented Preservationist, Enticed, Matole, Audible. They also have some by young sires with runners excelling on the track like Mendelssohn, Practical Joke, and Good Samaritan, Legacy Bloodstock. A really interesting cartoon this week from our friend Remy Bullock. It shows a horse going over a cliff followed by a pack of other horses. And then the, the horse is saying to himself, they're following the influencer. But are they following the influencer straight over the cliff? You'll have to decide. Remy's cartoon this week is terrific. Well, that's a wrap on this week's TDN Writers Room. I want to thank my partners in crime, Randy Moss and Zoe Cadman, along with our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, our editors, Nathan Wilkinson, Aliyah LaRocca, and Anthony LaRocca. We'll be back next week. Thanks for joining us. Mm-hmm.